In 2022, we celebrate 130 years of HBCU football. On December 27th, 1892, Livingstone and Biddle College, now known as Johnson C. Smith University, played in Salisbury, North Carolina, with Biddle winning 5-0. Over time, HBCU football has evolved. HBCU football's popularity continues to rise. Millions attend games each year and millions more watch on television. The HBCU bands provide some of the top entertainment in the country. Over that time, some of the best players to ever play in the National Football League played at HBCUs. Every Monday through Friday on the HBCU Football Daily Podcast, national radio and television host Donald Ware takes a look at what's happening in HBCU football and talks with coaches, players, administrators, and media about the 2022 season. Make sure you join the conversation on social media by using the hashtag HBCU130. Now, here's your host, Donald Ware. This is the HBCU Football Daily Podcast for today, Friday, September 30th. I'm Donald Ware. It's Friday! As you know how we do it on Fridays, we take a look at the HBCU National Game of the Week. Maybe a couple of games we could have picked from. I mean, you could have, you could look at... Uh, the 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 State Fair Classic in Dallas between Prairie View A and M and Grambling. I think Grambling's reeling a little bit right now. Prairie View A and M is trying to find its footing. But <clears throat> there's a game that to me leaves no doubt between two undefeated teams. I'm talking about Benedict and Fort Valley State as the HBCU National Game of the Week. And let, let's look at this matchup. I think this is a very interesting matchup. I think it could go uh, either way, and I'm going to share my thoughts on the matchup. So when I look at both teams are 4-0, when I look at Benedict's offense, it's a solid running game. They're going to run the football. They're going to be able to do it somewhat effectively at about 160, uh, 76 and a half yards rushing per game, led by Noah Zaire, Scotland who has 313 yards through four games. He's averaging 5.1 yards per carry. He's got three touchdowns. So he's the leading rusher of a team that definitely can run the football. There's no doubt about it. uh, Chennis Berries, the head football coach, he uses sort of a two-quarterback system. His primary quarterback is Eric Phoenix. But John Lampley, they both have gotten a lot of time as a as a collective. They are completing 58 percent of it, of their passes. But check this out. Nine touchdowns to zero interceptions on the season. Not a single interception between the two quarterbacks. And they're passing for about two hundred and seventeen point three yards per game. So it's not shabby. Got a couple of wide receivers. Um, as a matter of fact, they got one that can go and get it deep, one that's uh, more of a guy that's a little bit, and I'm not going to call him a possession receiver, but he's your go-to guy, right? Nathan Harden, six receptions, 212 yards, a touchdown. He's averaging in excess of 35 yards per reception. Then you look at Jaden Thomas, 10 receptions, 124 yards. He's got one touchdown. But what I like about Phoenix and Lampley in terms of what they do, yeah, those may be the guys that are getting the, the bulk of the receptions, um, and, and are doing the most, well, I shouldn't even say the bulk of the reception is doing the most damage, but eight different receivers for Benedict have caught at least five receptions this year. That's pretty good. So it shows that Lampley and Phoenix are, 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 are two quarterbacks that are going to be able to distribute the ball. They don't lock in on just one receiver. I mean, yeah, you could look at Harden as being kind of that deep threat and Thomas as being the main guy because he leads the team in receptions. But but eight other receiver or six other receivers have caught at least five balls this season. When I look at Fort Valley State's defense, okay, um, it's it, listen, it's a it's a rush defense. Now, if you think you're going to try to run the football against Fort Valley State, look to its seventy six point eight yards rushing per game. Okay, that is really, really good. That's all that that defense is giving up, okay? The pass defense is another conversation. I mean, the pass defense is giving up 200 yards of, of passing yards per game. That's a lot, especially for a team that 
averages close to 220 yards passing uh, per game. But it's a good I think it's a good run balance, I think, with Benedict's offense, uh, quite frankly. But I mean, that passing game is good. 217 yards passing per game. The other thing about the Fort Valley State defense, only one interception on the season, just one interception. Now, nine sacks as a unit through four games. That's not bad. You can see that that Wildcats defense is putting some pressure on the quarterback. The defense is led by Jalen Brown's got 27 tackles. Four of those tackles are for loss. And then Tim Olderman, who has 17 tackles, six and a half tackles for loss. He also uh, puts pressure in of himself on the quarterback. He's got four sacks on the season. Okay. Now, having looked at Fort Valley State's defense, previous to that, having looked at Benedict's offense, let's take a look at Fort Valley State's offense. <clears throat> Fort Valley State wants to run the football, and they've got a really good running back in Emmanuel Wilson. Emmanuel Wilson is one of the best running backs in the country. The, the kid can play. Going back a couple of years ago to Johnson C. Smith, had a good season last year. This kid is a dynamic running back. <clears throat> and you know... <clears throat> That Fort Valley State wants to run the football because in terms of run to pass ratio, it's three to one. So, you know, Fort Valley State wants to run the football in the form of, of Emmanuel Wilson, 136 yards rushing per game. He's got five touchdowns. He's averaging 6.3 yards per carry. The quarterback is Kelvin Durham, 54 percent of his passes, 59 percent, excuse me, of his passes completed. 770 yards. He's got four touchdowns on the season. He also has not thrown an interception, but he's the only he's the only quarterback that has gotten reps so far this season. Durham's got a couple of guys to throw the football to. Corin Edmonds and Fraylon Warren both are deep threats, so these guys both can stretch your field. Okay, when I look on the other side, that was Fort Valley State's offense. Let's look at Benedict's defense, giving up 151 yards rushing per game. OK, which which is a lot of yards. Right. But only 52 and a half yards passing per game. So Fort Valley State, I mean, Benedict, you're not going to run the football against them that uh, or uh, pass the football against them as much. But again, the, the difference there is Fort Valley State is more of a running offense anyway behind Emmanuel Wilson. So that may be a bit of a, of a wash. The other thing is this. When you look at Benedict's defense, teams are only converting 27% of their third down conversions and only one of five on the season when you're talking about fourth down conversions. This is a defense that's opportunistic. 31 and a half tackles for loss this season, 11 sacks on the season, and three interceptions. So it's a defense that really gets it done as a whole maybe not great in the running game. But, I mean, then again, you know, it's got a shutout this year, right? It, it, it's not giving up a lot of points per game. Only seven points given up, you know, I mean, it, 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 it's a team that is not giving up a lot of points. Um, you know, you look at a Lou Best uh, Dentalist. I hope I'm saying his name correctly, 14 tackles, tackle, six and a half tackles for loss, got five sacks on the season. He puts pressure on the quarterback is part in part why teams aren't able to have a lot of success in terms of passing the football against Benedict's defense, uh, Benedict's defense, John Hannibal, 25 tackles leads the team. He's got three tackles for loss on the season. These are, this is where I have some concerns about Fort Valley state. A Fort Valley state averages 10 penalties per game for in excess of a hundred yards per game. That's an issue. The other issue uh, Fort Valley State's only only converted on one of four field goals so far this season. So if this is a close game, and it's going to come down to the kicking game. I mean, the the so far Fort Valley State just hasn't gotten it done in the kicking game. Meanwhile, you look at Benedict. Benedict is five of six on field goals so far uh, this year. Benedict also shut out Lane. 14 to nothing. Think about that. Now, let's think about this lane team that went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Arkansas Pine Bluff to start the season, scored 42 points. They shut lane out. When the, the common opponent between Benedict and Fort Valley State is Kentucky State, I think Fort Valley State won its game, well, Fort Valley State won its game like 9-7, to seven, and, uh, and, and Benedict beat Kentucky State like 
I don't 38 to 14 or something like that. Benedict also handled Savannah State as well. So to me, where Fort Valley State has the advantage is in the running game. And also it's homecoming in Fort Valley. So that's a bit of an advantage. You're going to have the crowd behind you. But I mean, I would think, you know, I would, you know, it's not terribly far from Bennett, from uh, Columbia to uh, Fort Valley, Georgia. I don't think it's terribly far. You may have a bit of a crowd there with respect to Benedict, particularly that Benedict is playing well. That said, you know, I like the way Benedict has played overall. I think Fort Valley State has gotten more of the hype for this season. They both deserve the hype. They're both 4-0. But I think Benedict is the better football team. And I think ultimately Benedict wins this matchup over Fort Valley State. Your thoughts? You can hit me up via Twitter at box to row B-O-X-T-O-R-O-W. That's going to wrap it up for today's HBCU Football Daily Podcast. Uh, enjoy our podcasts over the weekend. First of all, I want you guys to be safe. We've got Hurricane Ian that is still wreaking havoc in parts of the country. So be safe where you are. Be smart. Okay. Um, enjoy our podcast. We're, we're not going to have another one until Monday. So maybe you have some time. You missed some of our podcasts. Enjoy them on our website at boxtorow.com, also on iheartmedia.com, or wherever you get your podcast. You can also listen on the, uh, you can also watch, I should say, on the Box to Row YouTube page as well. Have a wonderful weekend, and I'll talk with you on Monday. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the HBCU Football Daily Podcast. You can also listen to the podcast at BoxToRow.com, iHeartMedia, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to get your HBCU football fix on Box to Row with Donald Ware each weekend on the radio station near you and on Sirius XM on HBCU Channel 142 and on ESPNU Radio on Sirius XM Channel 84. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at at Box to Row for the latest in HBCU football and don't forget to tell a friend.